you're hearing the voice of your instructor who is going to walk you through an earlier version of a lecture you're going to receive in your class in a few weeks. As you know, you have a very hefty career portfolio or pre-career portfolio that's going to be due towards the end of the semester. Some of you are well on your way. You know how to write a resume. You have a resume. It's golden. You're good to go. You'll need to do some minor edits and then you could submit. Some of you have nothing. And so this lecture is really designed to give you some of the preliminary frameworks necessary for writing that resume knowing that we're going to cover it more in depth in class in a few weeks. We're also going to invite career services to come and give us a little bit more information as well. But I wanted this to serve as a little bit of a resume writing 101 online workshop. And we really want to focus on making your resume pop. That's what a resume is designed to do. It's designed to get the attention of whose ever desk that it winds on. So quick pop quiz. What do you think is the initial amount of time an employer makes to review an applicant's resume. Is it 15 to 20 seconds maximum or 45 seconds? What do you think? Yeah, you probably guessed the right answer. It's the one you thought couldn't possibly true, but is. 15 to 20 seconds. That is typically the amount of time a potential employer is going to take to look at your resume. Whoa. That means you've got to have a nice, clean, aesthetically pleasing, informational resume so that every second counts. But let's first begin with talking about why you need a resume. A resume is really a marketing tool. We don't think of marketing ourselves, but that's what a resume does. It's kind of the promise of what you're going to do if that company hires you. The goal of a resume is not to get a job. The goal of a resume is to get an interview. You are never going to have just an easy foot in the door with a job. You want to get an interview, and we're going to focus on interviewing in class in a few weeks. And really, a resume is something you need to have. Why? Because many organizations just require it. In fact, you're pretty hard-pressed to find a place of employment that even has an organizational interview process that doesn't involve submitting a resume, a curriculum vita, or something of the like. Now, there are a lot of things that a resume can do for you. If you have a resume that's neat, well organized, error free, and professional looking, think about what all those things say about you as a potential job candidate. You're neat, you're well organized, you pay attention to detail, you're careful, you're competent, you're the right person to hire. Those hidden messages are key. And although they're hidden, they're really not because they say various obvious things, which is why you don't want to have mistakes in spelling or grammar, smudges, um, incorrect information, uh, or information that's old and outdated. Let's talk about different sections of a resume. For some of you this might be obvious, but it's important to clarify because people who are sitting behind desks looking to hire somebody are looking for specific things on a resume. The first thing they're looking for is a header. A header is what appears at the top of a page. It looks just like this. What information should be included? First and foremost, in very big, legible, neat font, not obscenely big, should be your full name. Now, if you go by a nickname, you run the risk, really, because if you've submitted an actual application through, say, a website, you're going to be required to put your legal name. Those may not match up in the system, so I encourage you to use your legal name. Make sure you use your full name as well. Put your permanent and present address. Make sure that that's clear. Make sure that it's legible. If for some reason you're an out-of-state student, use your school address because hopefully this will be a current place and you're going to be moving into current employment. You want to include your email address and your telephone number. Now a very important note, that email address should not be foxchaser6432 at gmail.com. It should not be bubblegumprincess1999 at hotmail.com. It should be pewagner at sar.usf.edu or sstevens at usf.edu. It should be a professional email address. Remember those hidden messages, those things that your resume says about you. What does a professional email address say that foxchaser4729 at gmail.com does not? Something to think about. All that information really needs to be at the top of the page, and it needs to look something like this. You'll notice that there's not a lot of aesthetics here, there's not a lot of extra things, but it's all very, very clear. Then below all that, you need 
an objective statement. And the purpose of that objective statement is really just to communicate to the person reading your resume the type of position you're interested in. Are you interested in full-time employment or part-time employment? Are you interested in a volunteer opportunity or an internship? This helps clarify that you've thought specifically about how your resume fits within the position that you're applying for. So an example of the objective statement is a management trainee position with a specialty realtor or uh, technical sales with an energy-related industry in the Southwest, long-range goals of regional sales management, or to obtain a position as field service representative with some software corporation. These are all acceptable. My personal preference and the ones that I've seen, even as a hiring manager, always have that to obtain because for some reason that just seems to read better to me. But that really is a preference. What is not a preference, however, is really hitting at the type of position that you are applying for. And what I do like about example number two here is that it talks about how this is really a short-term goal and how it fits within long-term goals. As a student, I think that can be especially beneficial for you. But again, none of these are right or wrong. It really just depends on how you're applying. Just make sure that you have a clear objective statement. And that goes right at the top of your resume like this, to obtain an entry-level human resources position. Very clear, very clean cut, but it serves as kind of that buffering point for the rest of your resume. Then below that, you want to include your education. At the top, you want to include your most current education. So you're going to put the University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee. Do not put the University of South Florida. Put University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee, because we are a separately accredited institution. Make sure that you include the city and state if it's not a part of the title, but because Sarasota, Manatee is, it's optional. I still personally recommend an address or maybe just the city and state. For some reason, it just seems like it makes the most sense. It reads cleaner to me, but I'll let that completely up to you. You'll quickly see that there are a lot of opportunities to take resumes in different directions. There's not really right or wrong. There's just better and best, and I think it's a best practice to still include at least the city and state. Then, you want the name of your degree and, ma and major. Now, all of you are going to have a bachelor's degree, but a bachelor's of what? There's a bachelor's of arts, and there's a bachelor's of science. So, make sure you know what your degree is actually in, and then put it. Bachelor's of science in biology, or bachelor's of science in business administration, um, if you have a specialty, like you see in this example, just put a colon and then put your specialty, accounting. If you have dual degrees, if you have dual certifications, if you have a certificate program or a minor, list those separately. Make sure you list all degrees in reverse chronological order. What that means is put the most current at the top. So if you went to SCF for your first two years and now you're here, put USFSM at the top, put all your certificates and minors, and then put SCF below that. Make sure that your most recent degree is listed first. You should typically include a date or expected date of graduation. Now, not down to the day. So if you're graduating in 2017, just put May 2017. You can either put graduation date, colon, May 2017, or if you're not 100% sure, just put expected graduation date. If you're completing maybe a senior honors thesis or you're doing some extra work and you don't know if you're going to graduate in the spring or the summer and you have the flexibility, there's nothing wrong with expected graduation date. A lot of times on resumes that students produce, we see GPA. And that can work really well for you because remember those hidden messages. Think about what a 4.0 or a 3.8 says about you. Now, typically, you only want to include this if it's a 3.0 or higher. That's not to say anybody who has below a 3.0 GPA is a bad student. But this is a braggadocious thing, right? So you want to make sure it's bragworthy. And typically, we think 3.0 and higher is bragworthy. Um, you may use it for your entire overall schooling or maybe just within your major. Maybe you've got a, I don't know, 279 as your overall major, or yeah, your overall GPA. But in your major, you have one of 3.2. Then just put your major. Make sure you round down to the nearest tenth, as you see in the example here. And if your GPA is a 4.0 or fits any honors criteria, such as summa cum laude, magna cum laude, make sure that you note that. You can look up more information online, or you can visit Career Services. They can help you figure out how to best market your GPA, or even if you should market it. Um, for your high school information, once you become a sophomore in college, I don't recommend that you actually include it. 
I'll leave it optional. Um, some of you come from magnet schools. Some of you come from private academies. You have a lot of pride. I don't want to break it to you, but I'm going to. Most people don't care, right? High school doesn't really matter anymore. Um, if it did, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be taking this class. You wouldn't be trying to graduate from college. Pull all everything from college. Um, I don't mean to be to be rude, but nobody cares if you were prom king or queen. Nobody really cares if you were on homecoming court. We don't really care where you went to high school. So if you just absolutely must have it because you've got such tiger pride or whatever your school mascot was, fine. But know that it can be eye-rolling for some employers. They want to hire adults and professionals. And a high school listed on your resume says you are not a professional and you are not an adult. Just something to think about. You can list that education right under the objectives. See how this is nice and neat? Notice the use of bold. Notice the use of italics. I personally do not love excessive use of italics. I only like to see italics when they should be used, which is to emphasize something. I think that it works here, but I'll let that completely up to you. Again, there's no right or wrong. You don't have to bold. You don't have to italics. You don't even necessarily have to use bullets. But I will say, this looks clean. It is clear, it is easy to read, and I can easily grasp the education of this candidate. Then below that education, you want to list your experience. And use that term experience because that's what you have. You have specific past experiences that have qualified you to be qualified for this position that you're applying for. And think of experience as a very broad term. It is not just a job where you made money. It could be a full-time job, it could be a part-time job, it could be a job you were contracted to do, it could be self-employment, it could be volunteer work that you didn't get paid for. You are volunteering in this class on behalf of CBH, uh, Coastal Behavioral Health Care. That should make it on your resume. That's a big deal. That's a company that you're working on behalf of. Even though you're not getting paid, that looks really good for you. And then if you've had a practicum, if you've had a field experience, if you've done some cooperative education, if you've done service Saturdays, Anything you think is relevant, experience. List it. Again, being on your high school's chess club is not experience. Um, if you oversee a high school chess club as a volunteer now, that is. Just think strategically. What is experience? What qualifies you as a professional? You should always include the job title, your dates of employment, the company name, and the city and state, even if it's all the same city and state. Dates of employment can be tricky because some of you have been in jobs where you've had it for three months. And that may not necessarily look good for you. Hopefully, you don't have a whole series of jobs where you've only been in them two or three or four months. But even if you do, you want to list those dates because you know why? Employers know what's up if you don't. They know that that means you've been bouncing around jobs. So you might as well just list them. So it at least looks that you're confident in the career decisions that you have made. Always list your responsibilities for each position. Here I do recommend the use of bullet points. You want to start each line with an action verb. Always use present tense if you're currently employed, but if it's a past job, use the past tense. And try to vary your choice of verbs. Don't say managed every single time. Think about different words that you can use. Do a simple Google search for action-oriented verbs for jobs or career-related action verbs. There's a host of search terms you can use. Career services can help you with this as well. This is a little bit behind where we are. This is something you hopefully learned in SLS 1107. But think about each word that you use. Pull out a thesaurus if you need to. Try to tailor the skills and experience to the position for which you are applying. That's risky because it means you're going to have to go in for each job application you submit and adjust. But no future employer just wants to see a copy-paste job. So take the time and actually do that. You want to be concise, but you want to provide enough detail. Again, gearing everything to the current job you're applying for. And it really should look just like this. So you'll see objective in the top corner. Then you're going to see education. And then you're going to see relevant experience. Really, these are just hard columns that have been created. You can do it this way or not, but notice how it's nice and neat. All of these line up. All of these line up. All of these semi line up. This one probably should come over a little bit more, but they are at least right aligned, so it creates this kind of square shaped effect. I've seen things done both ways. There's like different spacing options you can use. It's totally fine. But notice how clean this is. Up here, you've got the title in bold. Then you've got the place 
listed in italics, and that I don't hate because that does emphasize something. Here you see the dates, the city, and state. All of that is nice and clean. And then you see these action verbs that talk about the duties or responsibilities you had as an employee while there. Now, don't make stuff up. Be honest. If you didn't manage something, don't say that you did. And never underestimate even the small things. Notice the varied use of terms here. Assisted, screened, observed. Train, participate, oversee, open, performed, organized, responded, answered. Up here is past tense. Up here, or down here is past tense. And this is present tense. Okay? So relevant experience, see how these are out of order? Ah, oh, interesting, right? Well, it's all geared to the job specifically. If the objective is to obtain an entry-level human resources position, this is the most relevant experience, even though it's past tense. And it was just an internship, unpaid. Now, if you're currently an Abercrombie & Fitch sales associate, ooh, sorry, but also that's still relevant because you're learning things that will help you here. How to train new employees. Interviewing and selecting employees, overseeing inventory and auditing, opening and closing the store, those all really relate to this, right? Because they're all about detail, they're about interacting with other people. Think about those skill sets that we talked about in class that employers are looking for. So think specifically, think strategically about how you list things on your resume. Some of you have honors and awards. Make sure you order those by dates, again using reverse chronological patterns, and rank the order by importance to the career objective. So if you had something that was related to, I don't know, um, the Human Resources Award, let's say, if that's what you're trying to get a job in, that's the most important one to list. Um, but either one of these is fine, or some combination of them is fine. Um, I guess the order by dates thing would happen if you had multiple awards in the same year. So if you all got some in, if you got four awards in 2014, then rank them importance to the career objective. Uh, but again, think strategically about how you do this. There is no right or wrong. It all depends on your unique set of experiences and circumstances. You can also list professional affiliations and activities. Order by date, again, reverse chronological order. So if you're a current member of the National Communication Association, that would go up top. If you're a past member of the International Communication Association, that would go near the bottom. But then you also, again, want to rank order from importance to, from most important, excuse me, to least important related to that career objective. Don't use terms like member of, just list them. Sometimes bullet points can work for this. And what you really want to do is emphasize your leadership roles. What did you do in that organization or that affiliation? Were you just a member or did you play some integral part? Um, some memberships require money to be a part of. Those are ones you're going to want to list even if you are only a member. You still want to list them. Um, an honor society, a disciplinary society, something like that. Spell out the organization's name. Not everybody's going to know the acronyms like you do. So I'm a part of the National Communication Association. Everybody in my field calls it NCA. But if I said that to you, you'd have no idea what that meant. So I need to say National Communication Association on my resume so people know what I'm talking about. Again, don't use those abbreviations or acronyms. And so what it's going to end up looking like is a lot like this. You've got all these things that we've talked about up here. You've got some honors. So if you're part of the Honor Society, ongoingly, um, List that at the top, and then see some past memberships here as well. Whoops, I'm so sorry. Let's go here. Then you can see activities as well. Let's talk about some resume do's, some resume don'ts, and then I'll guide you where you need to go for some additional help. Resume do's. Use action verbs, because action verbs imply action, which show that you as an employee know that you have to be doing something. Again, never underestimate those hidden messages of resume. Uh, so use action verbs. And use short and concise sentences. You're also going to write a cover letter. That's going to be a space where you can elaborate a little bit more. But in your resume, keep it short and sweet. Um, use specific amounts to keep things clear. So if you were a 75% employee or you were a 50% administrative employee and 50% sales employee, list those things. List dollar amounts if you've been a fundraiser. So you're going to raise funds in this class um, in your small group. That might be something you want to include on your resume. Maybe it's not. Maybe it doesn't actually help you. Keep in mind, you don't have to list everything on your resume. Now, I argue that where you are in your professional journey, mm, everything matters. But as you build a resume, maybe everything doesn't for you. So if you've got specifics that will help make your case why you'd be good at the job you're applying for, list those. List the number of employees you supervise, the percentage of work you've done, the amount of money you raise. But if it isn't helpful, then don't do it. 
Big rules. Keep your resume easy to read, clean cut, aesthetically pleasing, and at your stage of the professional journey, keep it about one page. For this class, I'm going to ask that you have a one page only resume. Why? Because that's hard to do. You could elaborate on and on and on and on and on. And if you think that you've had enough professional experience to justify two pages, just see me. But I want you to keep it at one page because that's going to mean you're going to have to strategically think about how you use the space. And remember, that sends a message as well. And then some resume don'ts. Don't use personal pronouns. I, me, my. Keep it kind of objective. Keep yourself out of it, even though it's a self-marketing tool. On your resume, do not include references. Sometimes references will be solicited, but you should always have them separate. If you include them stock on your resume, it sends the message that you're applying to so many positions that you've just asked your, res or your references if they can kind of hang out on that references page. It doesn't look well for you. You want references to be something you, you seek out on a special occasion type of thing if you advance to a later stage in the journey. Do not clutter your resume with non-essential information. Again, prom king, homecoming court, chess club in high school. Nobody cares. That sounds really crass, but you need a professional to tell you that. Nobody wants to see that on your resume. It does not matter, so don't include it. Don't make any misrepresentations. Don't inflate. You want to sell yourself to the best of your abilities, but don't lie. Don't make up information. Tell us exactly what you've done and tie it into where you're going. And don't include any personal information, including your social security number, your age, sex, height, weight, marital status, or even a photograph. The last one hmm, is flexible. The day and age we live in, I have seen many resumes come on my desk with a photo, and I actually think it's great because it shows me that that person is a person. And ultimately, I'm not hiring a piece of paper. I'm hiring a person. But know that not everybody feels the same way that I do. If you feel confident in your field, a photo is appropriate, that's fine. Um, those of you who are in graphic design and marketing can be a great way to market yourself. Um, we live in an age where you can be searched for online instantaneously, so really you're not giving away information that you're not already giving away online anyways. But again, that's completely up to you. These really are just some general principles as you start the resume writing process. Again, there's no right or wrong. There's only better and best. So I hope you will start developing a resume. You'll make it better. And if you want to make it the best it possibly can be, I definitely recommend you hit up USFSM's career services. Tony Rippo, Ben Hines, or any of their student workers can help you further finesse your resume. We're going to work on this in class, but I need you to start drafting up your first draft so we can make it better beyond these kind of preliminary checklists. If you have questions, reach out to Career Services, reach out to me, and best of luck as you write that resume.